For the course, I have chosen a very particular group in marble that has been acquired by the museum very recently. Uh, a block of marble that has been carved by one of the most important uh, sculptors of any time, I would say, Auguste Rodin, as we say in French. I think with the American accent, it will be Auguste Rodin. This piece was created in 1908 for a very important uh, collector, uh, a very rich, actually, industrialist called Karl Wittgenstein. He came from Vienna. But let me give you a little bit of um, context to this uh, artwork that you okay. can see. Uh, yeah, here. I moved in here. So, Auguste Rodin, as you know, was a very important sculptor active uh, in uh, Paris, a French artist. Let's say that when he organized a very important one-man show in 1900, in parallel to the international exhibition organized in Paris, it's how he became even more famous than before. Beforehand, he had already important commissions by the French state. But you have to imagine that in 1900, thanks to the international exhibition uh, that would bring to Paris many, many um, tourists, many art lovers, uh, many strangers, foreigners, and so on, uh, his one-man show was visited by many, many people. Mm -hmm. So it's more or less from 1900 that Rodin would uh, start to be getting many, many commissions by uh, people from all over the world, from American uh, uh, art lovers, but also from uh, different uh, uh, countries in Europe. And uh, of course, with all these commissions, uh, uh, Rodin had even a bigger atelier uh, that he needed to have to be able to accommodate all these uh, uh, commissions, because, you know, it's not only one person that would be able to carve so many marbles at once. Right. So for this uh, marble piece, actually, it was commissioned by Karl Wittgenstein, this Viennese uh, industrialist, who visited Paris, and as many, he would include in his visits in Paris a visit to the atelier of the sculptor. And when he visited this atelier, he saw a marble piece that was being carved by a practitioner, a practitioner mm -hmm. being someone who would help the master to carve a piece, and he fell in love with that commission, with that, and he fell in love with that composition. Okay. So he asked Rodin to uh, have exactly the same marble. Hmm. So let me step back a little sure. bit. Sure. The piece that Wittgenstein saw in the process of being carved in the atelier was a marble piece that had been commissioned to Rodin from another very rich art <laughs> lover called uh, Baron Thyssen, um, who commissioned actually five marble groups. So this uh, is the thyssen Bordemisa collection? Exactly. Okay. So um, the uh, Thyssen uh, version of this composition is right now in uh, Madrid, in okay. the thyssen Bordemisa uh, Museum. But Thyssen was very smart. He knew already that Rodin was carving many, many different versions of one same composition because of the demand of a very important clientele he earned all over the world. So Thyssen, for the group of Christ and Mary Magdalene, one of the titles of this uh, uh, art piece, he had asked Rodin to promise that he would carve no more than two uh -huh. versions of his marble. So one for him, for Thyssen, and possibly another one. So when Rodin accepted to carve a second one for Karl Wittgenstein, the Viennese uh, person, he knew that that would be the second and last one. So that makes this group at the Getty even more particular because right. uh, it's a very important uh, and uh, very uh, particular composition. And on top of that, it does exist only, only in two versions, one uh, uh, in Madrid, coming from the Thyssen collection, and another one here at the Getty Museum, okay. coming from the Wittgenstein um, uh, commission. So, uh, this uh, group represents, as you can see, Mary Magdalene and the Christ, who looks like he's made to a, a rock, uh, which shape looks like uh, a cross. That's one of the titles. Mm. Uh, Rodin would create uh, his compositions very quickly without thinking of the title uh, beforehand, and then the titles would come up. So, Sure, Christ and Mary Magdalene is usually the title we use for this composition because the secretary of Rodin, 
he was a poet, Rainer Maria Rilke, a German mm. poet, um, uses Christ and Mary Magdalene in his letters to the first uh, patron of his group, uh, Thyssen. Okay. okay. But uh, Rodin, when he was interviewed by journalists later on, said that of his group, he could also use other titles like Prometheus and an Oceanid, okay. or the poet, or the thinker being consoled by uh, the pity, genius and pity, and so on. Right. So there's not a fixed title, there's never a fixed title right. for the artworks of uh, Rodin. So how this composition was created? Well, it's always very hard for us art historians to understand the creative process of the artists, because most part of that happens actually in their heads. But um, uh, we have at the uh, Rodin Museum in Paris a model, smaller, okay. in three different materials. <laughs> plaster, fabric, and cross. And uh, wood for the cross. Right. Um, and uh, you can, uh, the Rodin Museum has just uh, reopened with a new uh, in installation uh, of their artworks. And it's now on display and it's really a fantastic uh, artwork. So you have to imagine for that plaster model, that would be, I would say, half of the height of this group. Okay. Uh, you have to imagine that for uh, the um, drapery that you see here on the legs of Mary Magdalene, this drapery was dumped in wet plaster okay. and put on the legs of that Mary Magdalene, which is in plaster. And then to create the cross behind the group, uh, Rhoda had actually used initially for the structure of his composition real wood okay. on top of which he would have put, well, he put uh, plaster. And so that's why it's described more as a crucifixion yeah. group. Yeah, exactly. Website, so it's right. true, and it's also true. But when you see, uh, you know, a man nailed onto a cross, we think in, you know, our, uh, at least uh, <laughs> traditions, oh, yeah. we think at Christ right. and Mary Magdalene. But you know, in antiquity, with uh, mythology, you have also Prometheus right. being nailed to a rock and then uh, being uh, uh, rescued. So there are many, many different right. interpretations. Let's say. So. Uh, Rodin created first this uh, plaster model, and we think that actually the plaster model dates from as early as the 1880s, so a lot of time uh, you know, before he started to uh, carve uh, the marbles. Then another thing which is very interesting for the creative process of uh, Rodin, from the 1890s, Rodin created compositions using figures that he had already used for other artworks. Mm. So this uh, um, uh, female figure, if you look closely at the upper part of the gate of hell, you will find this figure. Oh my goodness, yeah. In the middle of all the souls. Okay. Then he really loved that figure that he put, it's quite small actually in the gate of hell, it's in, in the upper compartment. Uh, then he reused it big scale as um, um, a figure called uh, meditation. Mm. Then when he created the uh, very important monument to the French poet Victor Hugo, he put that figure behind the poet and that figure was called the inner voice. As okay. if she was the one whispering in the ears of the poet, okay. uh, you know, all of his uh, writings. And then eventually we see her here yeah. <laughs> uh, as uh, uh, the embodiment of uh, uh, Mary Magdalene. So you have really to, to take into consideration that the art of uh, Rhoda is constantly in evolution, but also using things that he had created uh, uh, prior to a new composition. That's really uh, uh, fantastic. The way in which you would completely, uh, you know, change um, uh, the use of a figure that already existed in previous uh, works. Oh yeah. As I said, Rodin from 1900 got many, many commissions. Of course, he wouldn't have been able to carve himself all the marbles, and uh, he started to have a very productive atelier workshop in which he would entrust the carving of his compositions uh, in marble to 
practitioner, we say in French. I'm assuming practitioners. It's, right. it, it's hard to translate. Sort that, of like a so. journeyman in the guild system or in a, a, yeah, exactly. a high-level assistant. Yeah, exactly. But they would have been also uh, students, pupils who wanted also to get a better training right. to understand the working process. But it's higher than apprentice level, I'm assuming. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so actually one of the uh, um, uh, people that... Uh, Rodin truly uh, loved and appreciated for uh, his skills was an artist called Victor Peter. Um, he had his own career as an artist. He had, uh, he had earned uh, medals at the Exposition Universelle, the international exhibition, in 1900. Mm. And he was a teacher of art at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So very an important artist for, uh, by himself. Right. But in parallel, he loved, anyway, to carve in marble for Rodin. Mm. And he would always um, follow the instructions of the master without uh, interpret interpreting differently what the master wanted. Right. Because Rodin, although at one point uh, didn't put much <laughs> of his energy on actually touching the marbles, would always follow step by step the work of the people he would hire to work on his marbles. Mm. So he had always control on his compositions, all the time, in different ways. Of course, he would be uh, sometimes with them in the uh, atelier when he wasn't busy um, uh, welcoming a uh, new client or um, being also, uh, you know, organizing uh, exhibitions of his artworks with other uh, artists. So he would follow, follow, of course, the work of these uh, people in his atelier. He would also, and we have that in certain uh, uh, um, archives, he would also correct or give indications, actually marking some photographs. Hmm. So he would have photographs taken of his artworks in the... And then he would correct and say, no, I want actually the drapery to be more deep here. Uh, you should uh, insist on this diagonal. And we have that, really, with a pen, and he would really correct, uh, you know, as uh, kind of sketchy lines on the photograph. That's fantastic. And, and we have photographs in the archives of the Musée Rodin precisely for this uh, group. Oh, well, I think it's, it's for the marble carved by, uh, by Thyssen. Mm, mm. And what I think is truly fantastic is that Victor Peter, as an artist, would do compositions that big for medals. He was fantastic to carve, let's say, a group of five dogs for a medal that big. Okay. While in parallel, he would carve these big blocks of marble for Rodin. This must and, have been very freeing for him yeah, in a exactly. way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, possibly. And, um, and his work was even more important than just carving, following the instructions of the master. He would also sometimes prompt the master to carve in marble some compositions that the master had never thought to create in marble and would have left in plaster. So perhaps you're familiar with an artwork called Thought. It's a portrait of Camille Claudel, yes. the lover of Rodin. You know, it's this head emerging out of a, uh, a squared block of marble. It's isn't Victor, that in, that, it, that's in Philly, isn't it? The... Uh, well, there are, I think, more, uh, more than one version. I, okay. I know a version in, uh, in the Musée d'Orsay okay. in, uh, okay. in Paris. But, you know, you have this head emerging out of uh, a block of marble, which is the portrait, a lovely portrait of this yeah, uh, it's female gorgeous. head. gorgeous, yeah. Uh, yeah, very lovely. Um, and, well, it's thanks to Victor Petter that this uh, composition was carved in marble. Uh, he also prompted Rodin to carve in marble a very uh, complex composition in terms of carving the stone, which is um, uh, a group, um, a figure, actually, uh, with... Uh, many long hair and a very uh, aging uh, body. Mm. Uh, it was called in French the Belle Olmière and turned into a figure of winter. Okay. Um, but so, Victor yeah. Petter had a very uh, critical role. So, sure, he was, it's still, you know, the master, Rodin, decides on compositions and on how the block should be carved at every step. Right. But he really, uh, let's say, respected and trusted many of these practitioners, and Victor Petter is a very good example. Yeah. So there is a nice collaboration uh, between the two and a nice, a nice let's say, um, exchange of skills and, mm. uh, and mm. thoughts around, right. the, uh, around right. the compositions. For, so for this... Um, uh, piece, as you can see right away, there is a lot of contrasts between uh, several areas of uh, the uh, artwork, because you can see that most part of the uh, stone all around has been kept rough, 
Right. While you have uh, the bodies, and in particular uh, the female body, highly polished. Um, so, of course, uh, Rhoda was uh, someone who truly uh, appreciated all the possibilities that the, uh, the material uh, stone, and in particular marble, would, uh, would uh, give him to uh, enhance even more his uh, compositions. But there's also something very important to take into consideration. In the uh, 1870s, uh, Rhoda travelled to Italy. Okay. And we know, thanks to the letters he sends to his uh, wife, that he, he is truly completely amazed by the art of Michelangelo. Mm. And the art of Michelangelo truly had an important impact on uh, Rhoda from uh, that period on. Right. And uh, uh, there is one thing, among others, that uh, really uh, got the attention of uh, Rhoda, it's the, what we call in Italian, the non finito. Mm. In Italian, it means in English, right. unfinished. The unfinished. The unfinished. Right. You all have in mind the slaves right. uh, by Michelangelo, and right. you see how they emerge out of the blocks of marble that are still not finished and roughly uh, carved out. And some of the pieta. Some of the pieta, you can yeah. see some unfinished uh, parts, and that is called non finito in, mm. uh, in Italian. But most of these artworks, in uh, the case of Michelangelo, they were truly unfinished for different issues during the, um, the history of the commission, for a problem of uh, a little defection in the stone. It, Michelangelo didn't do that on purpose. Right. Although you may have seen that it created a nice effect. Rodin will take that and use it as something he will do on purpose. Mm. So, so it becomes part of his overall it, aesthetic. Exactly. Yeah. So when you see uh, parts here that I would call non finito, yeah. it's not that it's a non finished artwork, it's mm. Rhoda truly thinking through his composition and trying to understand how to use these unfinished aspects to enhance some other parts of his compositions because, of course, if you leave some of the areas unfinished, uh, you can enhance even more all the right. parts that are highly uh, polished. Well, and it seems also to, to sort of go hand in hand with the aesthetic of some of his bronzes because something about the additive nature of them and that rough surface texture that he seems yeah. to sort of glory in, in some of his work. Exactly. But then what you need to also uh, uh, take into account is that this kind of unfinished texture was actually highly cared about. Like, mm. I mean, it's not unfinished by chance. Right. So if you see these um, uh, little uh, um, uh, holes here, they are the marks of a very important, uh, you know, and strong, um, how do you say it? Cool. Like a like a hammer with a yeah, like a hammer. You know, it's a very strong uh, um, uh, kick that you would do in your tool to do that. It's not right. that it's unfinished. So this area, although we would call it non finito, has been actually worked through to create this kind of uh, you know. Uh, so the, the roughness is enhanced. Exactly, yeah. the roughness is differs from an area to another. You can see here it's mostly holes like that. Well, here, it's more kind of, you know, different waves, mm. I would say. Here, you can see that instead it's different strikes like that. So all, um, you know, the, the unfinished parts, or how we would call them, they have been actually worked through right. in a very uh, conscious way to create different patterns. And why? Because depending on how you create these um, uh, surfaces, um, the, the, the light is caught differently on the surface, on the marble, and so it's how it really animates your, uh, your composition. Mm. Yeah. And uh, even in areas that are highly polished, you, what I love is that you can also, uh, at one point, discover little details that are really... So look at that, how you have these kind of waves of all the uh, folds of the drapery, and look at this little... It's like that's just the extremity with this yeah. fantastic uh, little comma, I don't know how to define that. 
So it almost looks like something you would see on like the veil of a Madonna yeah, exactly. in a, in a so Renaissance relief. From far away, you think that this uh, drapery is quite thick, and then up, you, di you, you discover a detail that shows you actually how light this fabric yeah. may have been on the legs of a, uh, of a Magdalene. And of course, uh, you know, uh, what is also astonishing is uh, the way in which you would uh, carve the, the hair, the very long hair of Mary Magdalene, mm. that are that she uses to cover the body oh, of yeah. the Christ in pain. And you can see that they are also mixed with her hands here. Well, and that recalls the, the washing of his feet. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. So it really becomes her chief attribute here. Yes, indeed. While instead there are some other parts that um, uh, are quite, I would say... Um, uh, schematic, and it's not negative when I say that. If you look at the head of uh, Christ, um, it's also because uh, Rodin was very much influenced by uh, medieval uh, Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. And he had some in his uh, uh, collection. There was even one coming from Burgos, so a Spanish uh, crucifix in his uh, bedroom. And we know he truly loved uh, medieval art. So, you know, this kind of very geometrical uh, face, yeah. a little bit, uh, recalls this uh, medieval uh, art. Well, by the time the students see this, they will have seen some of the English uh, alabasters with the very stylized uh -huh. price and... Uh, so you have all these unfinished aspects all over the group, also uh, you know, on, the, um, uh, on the sides and on the back. And then I guess you can also catch on the top, that's very interesting because oh, actually yeah. you can see an area that most likely um, uh, was actually uh, the edge of the block of marble, like it's the trace of, uh, of a saw. Mm. Right. So that's very it's uh, highly polished, and then uh, it may have been decided not to uh, carry on these uh, kind of pointing marks uh, effects on this uh, on this uh, part. But it's truly uh, interesting to see all the uh, you know different transitions between the textures, and you can get that very well. Uh, for instance, uh, here between oh, these yeah. kind of unfinished <laughs> texture, then these uh, you know other tool marks here, and then here you arrive at highly polished uh, uh, areas. Mm. I also noticed on the other side the interplay of the two bodies and the space between them is yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you have it. Yeah, it's really, uh, uh, and that's uh, quite typical of Rodin. He would uh, always uh, conceive his compositions uh, to be, uh, you know, viewed from many uh, angle points. So, yeah, it's truly fantastic the it's way in really which sort of at one point you discover that the two bodies are not touching, but there is this uh, yeah. gap between, uh, between them. It almost makes it more sensual in a way. Of to course. Have that, yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, Rhoda is truly interested into the effect of his uh, composition because as you can see, of course, you know, this body for real wouldn't work, you know, it's so elongating, mm. so curved, but also because Roda was very much influenced by uh, Mannerist uh, art, and um, this figure was already uh, curved a lot in the gates um, of hell, as I said, oh, yeah. and same thing in, uh, when he uses uh, this figure as a uh, a figure of uh, meditation. So that's well, and even even Michelangelo distorts body. Yeah, exactly. And... Yeah, yeah, exactly.